Professor Crixus Vall adjusted his fourth sensory membrane as he glided into the Grand Mathematics Amphitheater of the Galactic Academy. His iridescent scales shimmered under the soft purple lighting, precisely calibrated to accommodate the visual spectrum of 37 different species. Well, 38 now. Computer, he chirped in his native Centaurian, displayed today's attendance roster. The holographic display materialized before his three primary eyes, and there it was again. That name that had been causing him mild digestive distress for the past three solar cycles. Sarah Chen, human exchange student. Asterisk. A human or in my advanced theoretical mathematics class, he thought, his scales rippling in what his therapist assured him was completely rational anxiety. The Galactic Academy hadn't survived 10,000 years of academic excellence by taking unnecessary risks. And humans? They were the definition of unnecessary risk. But here he was, preparing to teach complex hyperspatial calculations to a, a death worlder. The very thought made his auxiliary brain throb. As students began filtering into the amphitheater, Crixus observed their usual seating patterns. The gaseous xenons clustered near the ceiling vents. The crystalline rigelians arranged themselves in perfect geometric patterns near the front. The amorphous blob collective oozed into their customary corner, maintaining a respectful distance from the silicon-based life forms who found their nitrogen emissions mildly corrosive. And then, there she was. Sarah Chen walked in, walked on actual legs, carrying what appeared to be an archaic data tablet made of processed tree carcasses. Good morning, Professor Val, she called out cheerfully, her terrifyingly powerful death world or vocals modulated to what she probably thought was a soothing volume. Several methane breathers nearby vibrated in startled response, their emergency gas masks deploying automatically. Yes, good solar rotation, student Chen, Crixus responded, proud that only two of his hearts skipped a beat this time. He was getting better at this. Please take your designated isolation seat. The human nodded. That disturbing, head-bobbing gesture they used and made her way to the reinforced chair surrounded by the standardized three-meter safety perimeter. The chair had been specially installed after the incident with the previous furniture, which had apparently not been rated for human bone density. As Crixus activated the quantum blackboard, he felt an unusual tingle in his probability-sensing organs. Today's lecture would cover the infamous Taraxian equation, the millennium-old mathematical puzzle that had stumped the greatest minds in the galaxy. He had planned this lecture specifically to humble the human student, to demonstrate that despite their species' barbaric strength, some problems required true civilized intellect to even comprehend. Little did he know he was about to experience what humans called irony firsthand. Class, he announced, his voice resonating through the chamber's perfect acoustics. Today we discuss the greatest mathematical challenge of our age. Please ensure your mental recording implants are functioning. You will want to remember this day. He would remember it too, though not for the reasons he expected. Professor Crixus Vall's dorsal tentacles rippled with academic pride as he projected the Taraxian equation onto the quantum blackboard. The formula sprawled across multiple dimensions, its quantum variables shimmering in and out of probable existence. Behold, he announced, his voice modulator set to appropriately dramatic. The equation that has haunted our greatest minds for precisely 1,042 standard galactic years, three cycles and 47 micro-rotations. A collective gasp echoed through the amphitheater. Three vapor and students spontaneously evaporated in excitement, their backup consciousness matrices quickly downloading into their spare bodies. First discovered in the ancient archives of the Taraxian species, before they tragically evolved into pure energy and lost interest in mathematics, this equation represents the theoretical framework for perfect faster-than-light travel calculations. The human, Sarah Chen, was taking notes with a primitive graphite stick on processed tree flesh. How quaint. Currently, Crixus continued, his secondary brain throbbing with anticipation, our fastest ships lose approximately 0.0000001% of their mass during each jump. Hardly noticeable, unless you're shipping particularly sensitive cargo, like your grandmother. Several students emitted various species-appropriate sounds of amusement. The blob collective rippled in what might have been laughter, 
though it was hard to tell with them. The Taraxian equation promises to eliminate this mass loss completely. However, here Crixus extended his knowledge-sharing tentacles to their full academic length. Despite attempts by 40 different species, including the legendary math lords of Pythagoras Prime, none have solved it. The quantum computing collective of Rigel 7 spent three centuries processing it, only to achieve digital enlightenment and transcend this plane of existence before sharing their results. He projected a holographic timeline of failed attempts. The crystalline minds of Alpha Centauri shattered, literally, after discovering their solution was off by an imaginary number. The Silicon Sages of Transistor developed a drinking problem and opened a comedy club. Even the mechanical mathletes of Gear World simply rusted in place while contemplating the fourth differential quantum variable. The class's various sensory organs were fixed on the equation, each species displaying their own signs of mathematical awe. The photonic students had dimmed to a respectful flicker. The quantum butterflies had collapsed their probability waves into a single state of attention. Even the normally fidgety gas giants were holding their molecular structure together. Sarah Chen, however, was squinting and writing something with disturbing efficiency. The implications of solving this equation would revolutionize galactic travel, Crixus continued, deliberately avoiding looking at the human's unsettling display of focus. No more mass loss, no more quantum drift, no more accidentally leaving your rear thrusters three parsecs behind because you forgot to carry the imaginary timeline. He activated the historical simulation matrix, showing the spectacular failures of previous solution attempts. The infamous Nova Scotia incident, where a particularly confident mathematician had accidentally turned a small moon into jazz music. The Great Probability Cascade of 2874, which had temporarily turned everyone in the Crab Nebula into slightly different versions of themselves. Even the hive mind mathematicians of Beta Maximum, with their million drone quantum computing arrays, only managed to prove that the equation wasn't impossible. Shortly before half their drones developed an obsession with interpretive dance. More species-appropriate chuckles rippled through the class. Crixus noticed with mild alarm that Sarah Chen's expression had shifted from focused concentration to something humans called a smile. His third heart missed a beat. In his extensive xenobiology studies, he knew that human facial expression could indicate either comprehension or imminent violence. Now, he said, extending his grading appendages, who would like to attempt the first step of solving the unsolvable? I remind you that perfect scores are not expected. In fact, partial credit will be awarded simply for maintaining your sanity through the attempt. The amphitheater fell silent. Even the quantum butterflies had stopped their probability fluctuations. And then, defying all mathematical probability and professional expectations, a single hand raised into the air. A human hand, attached to a human arm, connected to Sarah Chen, who was still wearing that disturbing smile. Crixus felt all four of his stomachs sink simultaneously. This was either going to be hilariously disappointing or something his probability-sensing organs were desperately trying to warn him about. Professor Crixus Vall's optical membranes fluttered in disbelief. The raised hand of Sarah Chen hung in the air like an improbable quantum state, refusing to collapse into a more sensible reality. Ah! Student Chen, he managed, his voice modulator, barely masking his anxiety. You wish to attempt the Taraxian equation? Yes, Professor. Sarah's voice carried that distinctive human enthusiasm that had, according to historical records, preceded both groundbreaking discoveries and planetary devastation. I think I see something interesting in the third quantum variable's relationship to the hyperspatial constants. The professor's internal monologue kicked into overdrive, all three of his brains firing simultaneously. Asterisk, by the sacred algorithms. What am I supposed to do? The humans. Oh, stars, the humans. Their species had only achieved faster than light travel three decades ago, and they'd done it by, by eyeballing it, as they say. The blob collective in the corner began vibrating at a frequency that suggested either intense interest or severe indigestion. The quantum butterflies started generating alternative timeline projections, their probability wings flickering with possibilities. Very well, Crixus said, 
his professional curiosity overriding his survival instincts. Please approach the quantum blackboard and do remember the safety protocols. No rapid movements that might startle the gaseous students. Sarah stood up. Another unnecessarily vertical action that made several silicon-based students crystallize in shock and walked to the front of the amphitheater. She pulled out that primitive writing stick of hers and then did something that made Crixus's probability-sensing organs go haywire. She started drawing diagrams, simple two-dimensional diagrams, next to the magnificent multidimensional quantum equations. You see, Sarah began, her voice carrying that dangerous human confidence. If we look at the Taraxian equation from a different angle, asterisk, different angle? Crixus thought in panic. Asterisk, the equation exists in 17 dimensions simultaneously. It has no single angle. We can see that it's actually similar to something we call a Fourier transform back on Earth, just with extra steps. The class erupted in a cacophony of species-appropriate sounds of confusion. A photonic student flickered so intensely, they temporarily achieved laser status. The hive mind representatives began buzzing in discordant harmonies. Student Chen, Crixus interrupted, his academic pride kicking in. The Taraxian equation deals with quantum-level mass conservation across multiple probability spaces during faster-than-light travel. It's not some simple but Sarah was already writing more. Her graphite stick moved across the surface with terrifying efficiency, adding what appeared to be Earth numbers next to the quantum variables. Right, she continued, apparently oblivious to the growing chaos around her. So if we treat these quantum fluctuations like wave functions, the Rigelians in the front row began to vibrate at their resonant frequency. One of them started emitting a high-pitched whine that usually preceded either a breakthrough or a breakdown. And then apply this Earth concept called dimensional analysis. Asterisk. Dimensional analysis. Crixus felt his color-changing scales shift to the ultraviolet spectrum of pure academic horror. Asterisk. They named their mathematical concept after spatial dimensions. How brutally human. But something was happening. Something impossible. The quantum blackboard's probability matrix was beginning to stabilize. Numbers that had previously existed in superposition were collapsing into actual solutions. The Blob Collective had stopped their usual random movements and formed a perfect sphere, their maximum attention configuration. The quantum butterflies had aligned their probability wings in a single timeline, an unprecedented event that would later be written about in several scientific journals. Then we can simplify this whole section, Sarah continued her hand moving faster now, by recognizing that these 17 dimensions are actually just describing three-dimensional space folded through time. A Vaporin student recondensed out of pure shock. The hive mind representatives had gone so quiet you could hear their individual neurons firing. Crixus watched in fascinated horror as Sarah Chen, human exchange student, proceeded to do something that no mathematician in the galaxy had ever considered. She made the Taraxian equation simpler. And if we account for the mass conservation using Earth's basic laws of thermodynamics, asterisk, they have laws for their thermodynamics? Crixus thought hysterically, asterisk. Next, they'll tell me they have rules for gravity. The quantum blackboard was now glowing with an intensity that suggested it was either about to display a solution or achieve sentience. Several emergency backup generators kicked in automatically sensing the imminent breakthrough. Sarah stepped back from her work, that human smile still plastered across her face. So that should do it. The mass loss during FTL jumps was happening because we were trying to conserve mass across all possible quantum states simultaneously. We just needed to treat it like a closed system, and she was interrupted by a sound that hadn't been heard in the Grand Mathematics Amphitheater in over a millennium. The solution chime. The ancient instrument, installed by the Taraxians themselves, had activated. The quantum blackboard's display stabilized, showing a solution so elegant that three Rigelians immediately achieved mathematical enlightenment. The Blob Collective had shaped itself into a perfect replica of the equation, their highest form of praise. Crixus Val, respected professor of the Galactic Academy, holder of seven-dimensional degrees, and current witness to the impossible, 
did the only thing he could do in this situation. He initiated emergency academic protocols. Class dismissed, he announced, his voice modulator failing to hide his agitation. Everyone, please evacuate in an orderly fashion. Someone alert the Board of Quantum Mathematics. And somebody please help the Silicon Sages. They appear to have crystallized in pure shock. As the class erupted into organized chaos, Sarah Chen stood by the quantum blackboard, looking slightly confused. Did I? She asked hesitantly. Did I do something wrong? Asterisk wrong? Asterisk Crixus thought, his probability sensing organs now completely overloaded. Asterisk. She just solved the unsolvable, using earth math, with a graphite stick, on processed tree flesh. The emergency academic klaxons began to sound throughout the academy. This was going to be an interesting faculty meeting. The emergency faculty meeting chamber was in chaos. Professors from every department had assembled, their various appendages, tentacles, improbability fields waving in agitation. The quantum computers hummed ominously in the background, processing Sarah Chen's solution for the 47th time. Professor Crixus Val stood before his colleagues, all four of his hearts pounding at different quantum frequencies. Distinguished faculty, he began, his voice modulator struggling to maintain professional composure. What you are about to see defies all conventional mathematical wisdom. He projected Sarah's solution into the chamber's holographic display. The human student stood nearby, still clutching her graphite stick and processed tree flesh, looking annoyingly calm for someone who had just upended a millennium of galactic mathematics. As you can see, Crixus continued gesturing with his academic tentacles. Student Chen approached the Taraxian equation using something humans call back-of-the-envelope calculations. Heresy, shrieked Professor Luminox, his photonic form flickering in outrage. One cannot solve quantum-level equations on, on, what is an envelope? It's like a data packet, but made of paper, Sarah helpfully explained. Several professors recoiled at the word paper their sensory organs registering deep offense at the concept of processed plant matter being used for mathematics. The quantum computers chimed again. Another confirmation. The holographic display showed the solution's elegance in all its terrifying simplicity, where galactic mathematicians had attempted to calculate mass conservation across 17 dimensions simultaneously. Sarah had simply folded the problem in on itself. You see, she explained, pointing at her diagrams, we use this technique on Earth called dimensional analysis to check our work. If the units don't match up, something's wrong. So when I saw that the quantum variables were actually just describing regular space-time, but in a really complicated way, Professor Pythagoras Prime, the cube-shaped head of advanced geometry, began rotating in distress. But, but, the 17 dimensions are essential for describing quantum probability states during faster-than-light travel. Well, yes and no, Sarah replied, sketching another diagram. Those extra dimensions are really just describing the same three spatial dimensions plus time, just from different quantum perspectives. It's like, it's like taking 17 photos of the same object from different angles when you could just walk around it once. The silence that followed was so profound that even the quantum butterflies stopped their probability fluctuations. The main quantum computer's display updated again, showing a simulation of a faster-than-light jump using Sarah's calculations. The result was beautiful in its simplicity. Zero mass loss, perfect translation through space-time, and not a single grandmother left behind in quantum flux. This is... This is... Professor Crixus struggled to find the right words as his color-changing scales cycled through the entire visible spectrum and several invisible ones. This is mathematically barbaric. But it works, Sarah pointed out, that unsettling human smile appearing again. We did something similar when we first developed our FTL drives. Everyone kept trying to solve all the quantum equations perfectly, but then someone said, what if we just... Don't say it, gasped Professor Luminox. Eyeballed it and then fixed the math afterward? Several professors had to be escorted to the faculty lounge for emergency restoration of their academic composure. The quantum computers, however, continued their relentless validation of Sarah's solution. Each confirmation tone felt like another nail in the coffin of conventional galactic mathematics. 
The head of the quantum computing department, a silicon-based life form named Dr. Crystal Clear, spoke up, their crystalline structure vibrating with barely contained excitement. Do you realize what this means? The entire field of faster-than-light calculations, simplified by treating 17-dimensional quantum mechanics like, like, basic geometry? Well, Sarah shrugged, another disturbing human gesture. Sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution. We have a saying on Earth, keep it simple, stupid. Professor Crixus felt his third brain begin to hurt. You, you have a mathematical principle named after an insult. Oh no, Sarah laughed, a sound that made several gaseous professors condense in shock. That's just a general principle. We name our actual mathematical theorems after whoever discovered them first, or whoever won the argument about who discovered them first. The quantum computers chimed one final time, displaying their complete analysis. Sarah's solution was not only correct, but also reduced the computational power needed for FTL calculations by 99.9%. The remaining 0.1% was, as Sarah had noted, just to double check we don't accidentally leave anyone's luggage in another dimension. The implications were staggering, the ramifications, universe shaking, and somewhere Professor Crixus suspected the ancient Taraxians were either laughing or crying. Possibly both. The news spread through the Galactic Academy faster than a quantum probability wave. By mid-cycle, every crystalline spire and gravity-defying dome buzzed with the impossible story. A human had solved the Taraxian equation with a graphite stick without achieving digital enlightenment or spawning a single alternative timeline. In the theoretical mathematics department, Professor Spinox was found spinning in perfect fractals, muttering, but where are the other 14 dimensions? Where are they? Before being gently escorted to the Faculty Wellness Center for Emergency Meditation, the Academy's quantum communication networks nearly collapsed under the weight of incoming messages. The hive mind universities of seven different star systems requested immediate verification. The Silicon Sages of Transistor emerged from their century-long computational trance just to ask, wait, what? Emergency faculty meetings spawned emergency subcommittee meetings which spawned emergency sub-subcommittee meetings until the Academy's bureaucratic structure resembled a quantum probability tree. The agenda for each meeting was the same. How did we miss this? Simplification is not mathematics, Professor Luminox kept shouting, his photonic form strobing in academic distress. Next, they'll suggest we solve quantum entanglement problems by, by drawing pictures. The Galactic Mathematical Society convened an unprecedented emergency session. Representatives from 40 species attended in person, while another 30 joined via quantum hologram. The Blob Collective sent a particularly large representative that kept nervously splitting into smaller blobs during heated discussions. But their solution lacks elegance, protested the Dean of Hyperspatial Studies, their probability field fluctuating wildly. Where is the requisite minimum of 12,000 pages of supporting calculations? Where are the 17 appendices of quantum proofs? Where is the mandatory nervous breakdown that accompanies all great mathematical discoveries? Meanwhile, in the student cafeteria, Sarah Chen sat eating her lunch, completely oblivious to the chaos she'd caused. Three different documentary crews, one gaseous, one crystalline, and one existing in multiple quantum states simultaneously, hovered at a respectful distance, recording what they called the human method of fuel cell consumption. The Academy's emergency alert system, designed to warn of imminent mathematical breakthroughs, had been chiming continuously for six hours straight. The ancient Taraxian architecture itself seemed to be humming in amused resonance. Professor Crixus received exactly 2,847 quantum mail messages in the span of one standard hour. Half were from outraged traditionalists demanding a review of this so-called solution. The other half were from excited researchers asking if humans had simplified any other millennium-old problems lately. By end cycle, the Academy's administration had no choice but to issue an official statement. The Galactic Academy acknowledges that the Taraxian equation has been solved through more unconventional methods. A new course titled Human Mathematical Approaches, When Elegance Meets Efficiency, will be added to next cycle's curriculum. Stress counseling will be available for affected faculty members.
And somewhere in the quantum ether, the ancient Taraxians were definitely laughing. Professor Crixus Vaal sat in his private office, all three of his brains simultaneously processing the events of the past few cycles. His color-changing scales had settled into a contemplative shade of mauve as he watched Sarah Chen explain her solution to the Galactic Science Network's quantum broadcast. Really, she was saying with that characteristically human mixture of pride and nonchalance, Earth math just tends to be practical. When we can't solve something perfectly, we approximate. When something's too complex, we simplify. Sure, sometimes we blow up a few labs in the process, but that's just peer review with more excitement. The interviewer, a being composed entirely of pure energy and academic credentials, flickered in confusion. But how do you decide which parts of an equation can be simplified? Sarah grinned. That distinctively predatory expression that somehow managed to be both terrifying and endearing. We just ask ourselves, will the universe notice if we round this number to two decimal places? Several watching mathematicians fainted. Crixus found himself chuckling, a dangerous habit he'd picked up from prolonged human exposure. The truth was becoming uncomfortably clear. Humans weren't just surviving in the galaxy, they were speed running it. The latest reports were even more disturbing. Three other unsolvable problems had been tackled by human students across the galaxy. The quantum paradox of perpetual motion, solved by a human pointing out that infinite energy is just spicy perpetual motion. The grand unified theory of everything? A human graduate student had apparently solved it while waiting for their coffee to brew, muttering something about, if it walks like a quantum duck. The Galactic Academic Council had issued new guidelines requiring all mathematical problems to be presented to at least one human before being classified as unsolvable. They'd also banned the use of the phrase, it's theoretically impossible, in any paper that hadn't been reviewed by a human citing dangerous assumptions about the relationship between theory and human audacity. A notification pinged on his quantum display. Sarah had just submitted her thesis proposal, Simplified Approaches to Complicated Problems, A Human's Guide to Galactic Mathematics. The abstract began with a quote that made his probability-sensing organs tingle. Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. As Crixus floated home that evening, he passed the newly installed warning sign outside the mathematics department. Caution. Area contains humans actively simplifying complex problems. Below it, someone had scrawled in graphite. Universe survived so far. Perhaps he reflected this was the true danger of humans. Not their strength, not their endurance, not even their terrifying ability to survive on a death world. No, their true power lay in their ruthless pursuit of efficiency their barbaric elegance, their, their dangerous practicality. After all, any species that could look at a 17-dimensional quantum equation and say, what if we just folded it in half? Wasn't just surviving in the galaxy. They were optimizing it. End of entry in the Galactic Academic Archives filed under Why We Now Have Human Proofing Requirements for Unsolvable Problems. 